Click here to learn who are the best GP practices in your area. Click here to learn who are the worst GP practices in your area. It's that time of year again. It can only mean that the GP survey has been published as it is every July. Join us as we take a look at GP survey results 2023 and see if the GP survey is still fit for purpose. Let's check enhance your primary care and learning. Hello, EGP learners. Welcome back. Gandhi, how are you doing? Good. Yourself, Andy? Yeah, I'm not too bad. Yeah, it's um, it's that time of year again, isn't it? Um, it time is. Time to look at the GP survey results. Um, yeah, come, comes around quicker every year. Um, so, And I think it's going to have potentially more gravitas next year because we know the whole capacity access improvement plans and stuff. Um, they will be looking at the GP survey results, although we do know that they're not going to incorporate the data they want to look at for those plans and things. But I think it's important that we look at these on a yearly basis so the practice understand what's changing. And also the public definitely have some attention on these, especially since the media loves to showcase various different things and stuff, as we can see from the lovely friend of the Daily Fail. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, avert your eyes, everybody. But uh, just an example of the sorts of articles that come out this time of year. Um, I'm a little bit cynical. I think it's quite, quite lazy journalism. I'll stick my neck out and say, you know, the, mm. the data is really easy to get hold of. It comes out predictably um, this time of year. Very easy to search the data and have a kind of cookie cutter story um, that gives you just, you know, the top 10 in whatever metric you're looking at probably overall satisfaction in your area you know and the bottom 10 as as well yeah. um you know and it can be really really demoralizing for practices to find themselves in that in that situation if you do call your lmc you know they can help you with um you know with dealing with the media because you normally ask for comment um in those circumstances um but we'll, we'll get that off the screen as as quickly um as we can because it may be triggering for some of the yeah. viewers out there um and um yeah, so uh, well, let's get started. I mean, today, just so people know what we're looking at, we're going to have a little look at actually in a bit more depth about what the GP survey is, how it's conducted, you know, why it's conducted, actually, you know, um, um, and uh, look at some of the methodology there. Then we'll have a look at some of the data for 2023. Uh, um, in doing that, we'll show you some of the um, ways that the data can be viewed, you know, the analysis mm -hmm. tool, the PCN dashboard and so forth losing my voice here um, and then we'll think a little bit about how to use it and then we'll talk about the pros and cons you know uh, the good bits the bad bits of the gp survey um, as we see it and maybe make some suggestions as to how it can be improved in the future how does that mm -hmm. all strike you Andy? sounds like a plan so shall we get back <laughs> in andy coughs away and stuff and i think first thing we're going to talk about is understanding the methodology of the the gp survey itself aren't we andy so i know you're going to bring this up on the screen some of the data that they've got on things so shall we take a look at it yeah, let's let's bring that up on onto screen. So, really, just showing people where you know where they can look to um, to access some of this stuff. So, so um, so NHS has a good data center actually, which um, I've started looking at a little bit more. And this is where we are now. The link will be in um, in, in the show notes uh, below. And you can get all sorts of things from cancer waiting times to direct access to audiology. But linked here halfway down is the GP survey uh, results as well. So that's how you can get all sorts of interesting things and links out to um, different information about the survey. Um, something that is quite interesting is the frequently asked questions about the GP survey. Um, so uh, yeah, so Gandhi, do you remember which company does the GP survey who's done it for the last few years? I'm going to take my neck out and say Ipsos Mori because they're probably the one that does most surveys nowadays. Yeah, Ipsos. They seem to be just called Ipsos uh, these days by the look of things. Um, yeah, so it's done independently so by um, it's contracted out to um, an independent company to conduct the survey. I think Ipsos have been doing it for, for quite a long time, as far as I remember. Um, mm -hmm. Interestingly here, they do talk about wh why um, is it is it done as well? So it's looking like the about survey section. So done by Ipsos. Oh, yeah. Just <clears throat> another interesting thing to remember about the survey is um, it's, it's conducted once a year. So they post these out to people in January. Yeah. Um, and it's really asking people to uh, it asks people when the last appointment was, actually. And it's looking to try and sort of capture activity in the last uh, sort of six months leading up to January when the sample's taken. And then it's all the way forwards in July that we get the results. So some of the information will be about experiences that are nearly a year old at the time mm -hmm. that we learn about them. And I think we'll, we'll talk a bit more about the limitations when we get that get to that sort of section but but that's how it's done um and they just pick a, a sample of patients from your list 
uh, and post those out. Uh, when you're looking at your results, you can see, you know, the sample size, you know, how many were sent out and how many were returned. Uh, and we'll perhaps have a look at some of that data later. Um, the other interesting thing is, it says, why is it done? Um, which I think is interesting. So why do they think it's a good idea to do the GP survey in this way? And they say, we run the GP survey every year to track change over time and monitor quality of services. Um, I mean, do you think it does a good job of those two things, Gandhi? I think it depends on your perspective, doesn't it? It's also about yeah. the types of questions that you're asking. And we'll come to sort of how some of that's relevant a little bit later on, particularly since we've changed, I guess, what I like to call to multimodal consultations and things nowadays. Um, but yeah, it's a tool. It's yeah. the tool we have provided to us and then it gives some data. I think it's probably the way I'd summarize it. Yeah, it's the word quality that I've got an issue with, actually, because I think it, it's good at looking at the experience of services. I mean, I think that's that's obviously what it is. Um, mm. I don't know if it's the best way to look at quality, you know, and then thinking that they're looking at quality when actually what they're looking at is experience, you know, might be uh, problematic, um, I think. Um, and then they also say how they use it. So the survey will help the NHS improve GP practices and other local NHS services so they better meet your needs, uh, which mm -hmm. is another interesting um question actually because um and we'll probably get in the weeds later but just to jump straight to it what you see in the survey is actually your experience of your gp surgery can depend quite a lot on where in the country you're accessing gp surgeries and whether you're in an affluent area or a, an area of facing yeah. disadvantage um and actually i think that's come through loud and clear for the last few years and i'm not sure that the NHS is using that information to improve those practices, you know, in, in the most logical ways in terms of potentially, mm -hmm. uh, you know, looking at funding for uh, patients and practices in difficult areas. So I think that that's, you know, an interesting point. Um, and then um, just if people really want to get into the weeds, you know, about the methodology, um, there is some really good information. So, um, you know, people might think actually, you know, what about you know, if not that many people who are younger, you know, fill that in, you know, are are their thoughts represented? Um, and they do some weighting of the data to account for the fact that some demographics, perhaps younger, perhaps certain ethnic demographics might disproportionately not return surveys. And they do attempt to adjust for that in the survey. And they talk about that there. And if you really want to get into the weeds, there is a technical <laughs> annex which you'll be willing to know we won't be doing an episode um, looking at. Uh, but, you know, if you're a bit of a statistics, you know, um, nerd or, you know, or you you want to see how they handle some of the criticisms that you might have of the data, then you can find it all here. You know, something I was interested in um, was uh, actually the confidence intervals, because I, I was wondering, actually, when you get down to practice level comparisons when actually the number of return surveys who have answered a particular question can be quite low you know actually can you compare practices properly you know if the results are fairly close you know within 10 percentage points actually do the confidence intervals overlap you know meaning that it's a it's a fairly meaningless comparison um and actually they do um discuss that problem and mm -hmm. the confidence intervals and if you download the data uh, in excel spreadsheet form which you can do um then you can actually see what some of those confidence intervals um are so if you're finding that you really want to get into the weeds of how you compare to the practice next door you know you can go as far as looking at the confidence intervals on the downloaded data uh, but that's probably going pretty pretty deep in so uh um, yeah. maybe maybe if we zoom zoom back out and just think well we start let's have a look at this year's results then shall we andy yeah so there's a few ways you can look at it so um on that nhs statistics website you know they do um uh, a headline findings um pdf which i think is really useful um the most useful the, well no it's really interesting the most interesting thing about it is that um the main question that they choose to compare over time is not the one that I'd be most interested in. I'd be most interested in people's overall experience of the service. You know, I think that's the most interesting statistic. But they they just put last tried to make an appointment, um, you know, and 77 percent of patients last tried to make an appointment in the past six months. I don't know why that's there. I think it's because it looks fairly consistent over time where there's been a quite significant drop in the overall satisfaction. Um, mm -hmm. with the service if you look at that metric over time so that was interesting but um it you know it gives us gives an interesting overview i guess looks at the ways people have been accessing 
their GP surgery, gives an overview of the number of responses, you know, which which I think is useful to know. You know, 760,000 responses. It's a big survey. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it, it is a big survey. Um, so so that's that. But people might be thinking that's well and good. That's at national level. What about me? You know, or, or, or how can I make some useful use of this um, survey? So uh, so there's a few ways. So um, let's have a look at the, the PCA dashboard first, actually. Um, so it's a really good way to compare with your uh, neighboring practices. I've been pretty bought with the links will be in uh, below, but it's just GP hyphen patient dot uk forward slash PCN hyphen dashboard will land you there. And you look, you can look at any PCN in the country mm -hmm. and you can look at the responses for the practices, the individual practices within that primary care network um, compared against one another for any of the questions in the survey. And you can look at the changes over time. So I've selected my primary care network here, Ballwell and Top Valley in the north part of Nottingham City. And this is just looking at question one. How easy is it to get to on the phone? Uh, but you can look at, you know, all all the questions. They're selected by section. So there's some tabs at the bottom. You tab through the different sections of the survey and then you select the individual um, question. So and I think you can exclude and um, in and out different practices if you just want to zoom in on comparing, you know, two practices in particular or one practice in your primary care network might be a bit of an outlier in terms of how it's structured or the types of patients that it sees. And you might want to exclude those from the yeah. comparison. So that's good. Yeah. So any thoughts? I think this has been there in previous years. I think it looks a bit better this year, which is good. Mm -hmm. Anything I think there's more going to focus on, like you say, that network level analysis, because often people say, well, that doesn't reflect my practice population. I guess the closest thing to a practice population is your neighbouring practices, of which traditionally that's what most PCNs are based off. They're based on neighbouring practices. May not always be the case. And not all PCNs are based on geographic basis and things. Like you say, there can sometimes be some outliers. So typically things like university based practices, practices that focus much more on asylum seekers, for example, or homeless patients can help them be outliers and some of this kind of thing um, and, and various other makeups and things. But yeah, I think it's probably a more useful comparison than some of the other kind of stuff, like, for example, comparing against national data, because actually yeah. national level data is more complicated in that sense. It's useful to have a benchmark. Let's not be, you know, mistake about that. But having that local data is often more useful to compare against. Yeah. And I've just I've just gone to the summary page here because people might be interested in oh, how many questionnaires were sent out in my area? You know, it's about 2000 in Ball and Top Valley uh, mm -hmm. and how many were returned and what was the response rate? You know, so that's all there. I think what I quite like about this is that um, in previous years, and I'm thinking maybe back a few years before the primary care network dashboards were included at all, if you wanted to do a comparison between different practices, you could do it and, and it was a worthwhile exercise, but it was a little bit more fiddly. You know, this is very much something that you can pull up in a practice meeting without much preparation and just start comparing with, with your neighbors and, and doing some useful comparisons. So I think it's a really, really good, good tool probably mm -hmm. the, the best tool and the best way you know to, to quickly look at the data i think um so that's so that's that anything anything else on that gandhi no i think i'll probably just come see the comments i've got in the pros and cons because i think that yeah. may help in that section but next we're going to analyze an actual survey won't we andy and show people how to do that yes so um so you if you go to the, the main website um you can sort of search by practice and so forth and i think that that's or postcode i think that's probably the way that patients will will search but at the bottom um you can look at the analysis tool so if we click through on that there's two ways you can look at this so you can and this basically, basically allows you to build some searches based on the results and you can look at um the results for this year or you can kind of look at, at trends over time so um i think we we built a um i think it was a trends survey actually that we looked at let's just go back to the analysis tool and look at trends so this is how you would go about it so we built a national a trend looking at national results because i think that'd be most relevant for everyone uh, watching mm -hmm. and listening to this at the moment but you can look at ics level you can look at pcn level and you can look at individual practice results uh, but if we click through to national results you can then as you're building your search you can choose which questions to look at so and the survey is broken up into these areas local GP services, making an appointment, your last appointment, overall experience, some specific questions that have been asked for the last few years around COVID-19, your health, which is about the person completing the survey, um, and what when your practice closed, 
and then some other questions about that person and their kind of demographics and so forth. You can open these up and then you can select the individual questions that you want to appear in your results. Now, a bit of a warning, after you've selected your questions and you click through, it takes some time for the yep. results to be displayed. And the more questions that you include, the longer the time is that yeah, that it will take to return your results. So it's not something you can really do live in a meeting that you need to think no. about this before. Select what questions you're going to um, analyze and then click compute because it took oh, probably five, ten minutes um, for it to crunch our numbers. Um, but here we are. So here we, are we looked at about ten of the 30 plus questions as well. Just to be clear on that point, we didn't look at all the questions. So if you want to compare everything, it will take considerably longer. But yeah, Andy's right. It was about 10 minutes. We had to leave it to run for. Yeah. And, and actually, the, the, the analysis tool is even more powerful than that. It, it does allow you and it's quite user friendly as well. But it allows you to say, actually, I'm interested in these questions, um, you know, across the ICS but I'm really interested in over 65s, you know, and you can actually add, um, you know, additional kind of inclusion, exclusion criteria to the searches that you build. So it is a really good tool, but takes time to produce the results. Um, so here's what we got. So we chose to ask a few questions that just struck us as being interesting for one reason or another as we mm -hmm. were going through. So we asked, how easy is it to get through on the telephone to your GP practice? So this is just on average across the whole country um and we're seeing uh, the results are broken out quite nicely as well so it's basically kind of positive results or negative results so and they add up to 100 percent. so all of the results are um represented here um as either good positive results or, 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 or negative results so if we look at getting through on the telephone in 2018 70 percent said it was easy and 30 percent said it wasn't coming through to 2023 50 percent said it was easy 50% said it wasn't. And that's something that's declined quite sharply since 2021, significantly worse in 2022, 2023. Um, yeah. Any thoughts on, on that one, Gandhi? No, I mean, I think it reflects some of the challenges that we're definitely seeing in general practice in terms of capacity and stuff. Um, it doesn't comment on volume, obviously. That's one thing it doesn't have a, mm. a mention on um, and demand. Um, but we can see there's definitely been a significant change that happened from 2021 to 2022, and that has continued to keep pace with after that point. So actually, if you look at the change from 22 to 23, it's a fairly minor shift. Um, but yeah, obviously, previously, that's a big drop that we can see there quite a significant yeah. one. And that's a pattern in some of in a lot of these results, actually. There's very much a, a pre and mid pandemic level, and then there's a sort of a post pandemic um, kind of new reality, you know, that comes yeah. through in the last two years. You know, something happened 2021 to 2022 when uh, when many of these results shifted. We had a discussion about this particular question in our practice, Gandhi, and we were asking, actually, is this question as important as it used to be? Because this, this used mm -hmm. to be one of the most important questions um, that we looked at in the GP survey, and we used to pull our hair out about the results to this. And we still do, because it's really important that people can get to it on the telephone. But we were saying, actually, a lot of people choose not to talk to us on the telephone now. A lot of people will send us e-consults um, or will message us in other ways, you know, or will interact with the practice in other ways, ordering their repeat prescriptions using the NHS app, for example. Uh, and we're a little less concerned about this one. I don't know if, mm. you've, if you've kind of had that conversation, Gandhi, or... You know, the phones um, so are... we haven't in the practice, but I think it comes down yeah. to the main model of root of how patients can contact your practice. So if you were, for example, a practice moved to completely total triage through an online consultation platform, this question may have less meaning than some of the other ways and, and stuff. Um, and therefore, your results can be completely different to, example, a practice that focuses very much on telephone based triage, which we do. Um, and therefore, that's going kind to of have different meaning, obviously. So I think it's important to understand the the individual complexities of the practices themselves and understand the data that comes out of it. Yeah. So another question we looked at was how often do you see or speak to your preferred GP when you would like to? Um, this, I think this is quite an important question. I mean, uh, all of the focus at the moment is on access, but as we've talked yep. about and had some prominence within say the health select committee report chaired by Jeremy Hunt when he was chairman of the health select committee, um, there was some in some, increased focus again on continuity um, as uh, a good mark for quality in care and as something that improves outcomes. And I think this is one of the best questions for looking at continuity uh, in primary care. So that's why I thought it was important to look at. Um, it's declining over time. I don't think there's any shock there. Um, 
you know, the, the, the policy focus is on access and there isn't really a policy focus on continuity and consequently people will, yeah. you know, will have to prioritize access for their patients over continuity. Um, so I think that's quite, quite sad, actually, um, that it's gone from 50% to 35% of people being able to speak to their preferred GP. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, I agree. I think it, it's a marker of the reflection of the fact that GPs are reducing their clinical commitment times as a result of the complexity and the challenges that we're all facing. The number of GPs we know is declining. The length of time they're spending doing clinical work is declining. Therefore, that's going to impact continuity, as you mentioned. Um, so therefore, it's going to be less reliable. People are less likely to see their preferred GP as a result of it, particularly as we move towards a, a more labile workforce and stuff. Yeah. And also, I think I think there's something about actually managing the uh, pattern of demands and expectations from patients as well, mm -hmm. which I think is down to government and policy and messaging, um, because it affects how the patient, what it affects what the patients think they should be asking for, and it affects mm -hmm. what our GP receptionists, you know, give them really in terms of the policies yeah. they're following internally, and just in terms of what they feel they should be doing based on what they've seen on the news that morning, you know, and I think patients are much more likely to end up with a quicker appointment with someone that they don't know than a, a, an appointment that they might actually be medically suitable for waiting for with someone who um, actually knows them better and that might be better for mm -hmm. them and better for their health and they might actually feel more satisfied with that but everyone's focus is on access at the moment so i think this shows that if you kind of neglect something as a policy area it will decline you know i think that's one of the messages i'm taking yeah. from this interesting so the next one is overall, uh, how would you describe your experience of making an appointment? Um, I think this is interesting because previously the kind of access on the telephone used to be very similar, getting at something very similar to this really mm -hmm. about access to the to the practice. But there's other ways that you can make an appointment now um, declined over time. And there's that step decline from 21 to 22, 23 um, that mm -hmm. we occur there. Gandhi, what do you think happened 21 to 22? Um, got some thoughts myself, but but there's there's a decline in, in many of these experience questions across the board mm. at that time period. You got any thoughts about what happened? At that I, th time? I think there's been a, a massive shift, isn't there? Because from 21 to 22 is when we started to see that freeing up and awareness from the whole COVID scenario. So mm. I think the tolerance for people to accept that things had changed had, had become different. The backlog started having a much bigger impact come 2021 because on, under 2020, obviously we spent most of that year in lockdown on and off. 21, we were starting to come out of it with the vaccine rollout and stuff. And as a result of that, people then started to expect to have more available healthcare. But actually the healthcare service was massively limited in terms of its ability and capacity to deliver that because of the health and safety regulations we were all having to work under. But public perception was very much different to that. And then obviously the backlog has had more of an impact because now people are having to wait longer to see clinicians with various different things that has an impact on access that feeds into that whole cycle of stuff and i think it's just you know expectations are different to what the capacity and the capability of the healthcare system is based off the resources that we have yeah no i yeah i agree it, it, it's kind of opening up and i, I think something changed in the media coverage um yeah. th where i think kind of satisfaction levels might have been supported by the type of media coverage that we had of nhs and general practice you know during the pandemic which was quite supportive and then there was a real shift in that afterwards yeah. and i do um think that that affects people's perception of the services you know what they're being constantly told in the media about them i think has an impact as well as the underlying um quality of the service um this one looks like this question was only asked um in uh, in this year's um, results, which is interesting. It'll be an interesting one to watch over time. What type of appointment um, was your last general practice appointment? I guess it's been um, politically and media wise quite a hot issue over the last year. You know, is my GP practice offering telephone mm. appointments or face to face appointments? You know, that that particular few months ago, that was quite a, a hot issue. Um, and it looks like um, you know, twenty eight percent were on the telephone, sixty seven percent were to see someone at the practice. So that might be higher than you might have predicted you know if you just watched the mm -hmm. headlines um and then to see someone at another general practice location so that's interesting so that probably represents um practices where perhaps extended access network hours might be being delivered from a different practice with surgery, work, yeah. yeah or from a you know from a, a federation-led hub or something like that um video calls one percent so 
um, quite low, but nationally, that's quite a lot of video activity, I guess. And to someone online by a text message. So I think that's some of the sort of text or they're not really looked at electronic messaging that isn't a text message, you know, which I think mm -hmm. is something that ha happens. I wonder if that's been been captured there as well. But sometimes with an e-consult, people will get an electronic message back, you know, that satisfies, you know, yeah. their contact with the practice. So um, be interesting to watch how that develops over time, I think. Any initial reactions? I think it reflects what people may expect to see. You know, I think the the number that was face to face probably surprised some, may not surprise others. Um, mm -hmm. Telephone obviously being more of a method than video based consultation. Interesting to see how that changes with the new SCA exam, um, because obviously that's a video interface based mm -hmm. examination. And if the exam on how trainees are taught changes how the mode of consultation is, will it have an impact on how practices then deliver appointments as well? Be interesting yeah, to see if that has an impact. It'll certainly change people's level of comfort with that sort of mm -hmm. consultation, I think, which might mean when you know people are more likely to press the video consult button yeah. in the future. I know a, a large part of the reason why 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 I don't like video consultations like my colleagues is that's just it's not how we were trained. You know, we were trained to do face to face appointments, and we have some experience, you know, of telephones going back multiple years. So that's how we mm -hmm. choose and would like to consult. Might be different in the future for the reasons you highlight. Okay. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So um, another question we looked at was, was who your appointment was with at the general practice, because we we know that there are a lot more different professions working out of GP surgeries and delivering, you know, GP um, appointments in GP surgeries. Um, uh, thinking about the primary care network, additional roles, reimbursement scheme roles like pharmacists, physicians, associates, um, link work prescribers, yeah. health and wellbeing coaches, mental health practitioners, you know, the list goes on, uh, doesn't it? Um, and yeah, so we're seeing a decline over time um, in people who um, report that they're having appointments with a GP. And that's quite steady, really. So we're not seeing that cliff edge, you know, 21 to 22, 23 mm -hmm. cliff edge there. Um, nursing appointments kind of going up and then down a bit and then up again. So that's probably um, the same over the last three years. General practice pharmacist didn't exist in 2018. Primary care network um, DES came in 2019. So we're mm -hmm. beginning to see some people seeing a clinical pharmacist, although an increase over time is not statistically captured here, although that must be going up over time. Mental health professional, again, we have the mental health practitioner roles coming in in the kind of latter, kind of half of the mm -hmm. um, PCN network, DES, other health professionals, steady increase up to 5%. And four percent of people not sure who they see who they saw uh, at the GP practice, which I think is interesting. I guess a lot of people maybe they they perhaps know it wasn't a GP or that it wasn't a nurse, one of the traditional or more traditional roles, but they're mm -hmm. not quite sure who it was. So that, that was interesting. Um, and also they're asking about specific professions, aren't they? So it might be that they saw someone who, who isn't represented as a as a response on on the question. Yeah. So interesting. You got any any thoughts about that, Gandhi? It's quite expected, I think. I mean, we've seen the increase in the PCN DES roles and the provision of that to general practice, and as a result of that, more availability with other clinicians as a result of that. So you're going to expect to see that difference. Additionally, obviously, the GPs are providing most of the supervision for that. So there's going to be a natural decline, as well as also the decline in GP numbers themselves as well. So I think that's why we're seeing some element. But you're right, not as significant a drop as I think people were expecting. So that probably contributes to the fact that GPs are actually spending more time with patients than people think, in my view. Yeah, still working hard, <laughs> definitely. Um, so, and then um, only got a few few more of these to look at now. Uh, yeah. Last time you had a general practice appointment, how good was the healthcare professional at giving you enough time? So, and I always think when you're looking at these practices, you know, um, look at these questions as well, you know, how people felt about the experience. Yeah. Uh, because often, even if some of the kind of access type questions are poor, often this is an area where, uh, people's experiences maintained and this can be really good for, for practice morale and actually demonstrating that you know you might be in an area uh, or a situation where you are struggling to recruit you know resources are tight but actually when people can see you and have an experience of the practice they still have a good one um, and so this is is actually holding up pretty well over time and we're not seeing that experiential kind of drop off um, or that you know that that uh, what we're seeing with some of the other results where the results worsen in 2022, 2023, post-pandemic to before. So I think that's holding up. So that's quite good. 
And this question is about confidence and trust. During your last mm -hmm. general practice appointment, did you have confidence and trust in the healthcare professional you spoke to? So I think this is a good measure of just like that general experience with the healthcare professional. Yep. Not the whole experience of the practice, which can include, you know, ringing up, getting through the telephone, booking, does the website work, you know, things like that. This is actually the healthcare professional. And this, I think, is holding up quite well over time. There's a small decline, um, but still well over 90% of people having uh, confidence and trust in the healthcare professional they spoke to, which I think is really um, is really positive. Um, and then uh, thinking about the reasons for your last year appointment, were your needs met? Similar question, I think. This is, again, there is a small decline, but holding up fairly well. And then the last question that we looked at was overall, how would you describe your experience of your GP practice? And yeah, this is where, so last year there was a lot of headlines about this drop from 83% to 72 percent um you know i think it was the biggest drop in satisfaction that's ever been seen while this data has mm -hmm. been collected over time uh, and actually it's very similar at 71 percent um in the results from january you know it, that 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 declining trajectory has not continued and i would say it's stabilized um which in itself is interesting isn't it so it's stabilized so i think there's just something that happened 21 to 22 um that's made a big difference and i, and I think we've identified that that's that kind of post-pandemic sort of changes an era both systemic and in terms of messaging around general practice mm -hmm. any final comments about the results can before we start kind of picking a point apart whether we think the survey is positive no, ne negative good bad what the problems are i think you're right you know there's that element of not just looking at the access data but also looking at the more qualitative data in terms of the experience of patients and things and as you can see from majority of our no, that's been generally quite positive still there has been a gradual decline still is that a reflection again on the resourcing the you know the capacity of the system and, and various other aspects that play into that experience that patients have um i guess there's some things missing um from my perspective i know we're going to cover that in the pros and cons um but it does show the differences and i think for practice in particular it's worth having a look at this data individually at the very least to understand how things have changed for your practice but then there may be other things to consider as well, which we are going to come to probably now, aren't we, Andy? Yeah, I guess so. So, yeah, positive negatives of the survey. What what do we think about the usefulness, I guess, the utility of the survey? It's a big undertaking. A lot of resources mm -hmm. go into it. It's a very visible survey because of that big bang uh, publication of the results um, once a year. But, you know, how how useful is it actually? Um do you want to kick us off, Gandhi? Positives. We'll, we'll, let's split it between positives. Right, so let's and go for negatives. the positives. Um, so it's a nationally captured survey around the experience and um, the availability of general practice. So the fact that it happens every year is still a positive thing in my view. And it can give you useful information that's then not driven by the practice necessarily. So in that sense, independent and therefore verifiable from that point of view. Um, so I think that's a real positive. I think they are adapting the questions every year as well. We've seen that with the introduction of new questions and the takeaway of old ones that are less relevant and stuff. So I think it's important to see that change in terms of how general practice is evolving, not just steadfastly sticking to old fashioned type of questions that may or may not have any relevance anymore further. And actually, the website is really cool. It, it allows yeah, a pretty good. decent analysis there. You know, it's, it's a really positive thing to look at in terms of how to analyze data and it gives you an effective way and stuff so i guess they'll they're be my big three positives what about yourself andy yeah i mean i think uh yeah it's, so it's rigorous rigorous design you know mm -hmm. of the survey it's been running for quite a long period of time you know so there's a lot of experience in running the survey it is quite meticulously done um, and there's a lot of back data to, to make those comparisons over time which is really good um i think if you're looking at kind of primary care network level ICS network level, national level, I think that the sample size is good enough to give us a pretty well powered survey mm -hmm. in terms of um, that the results are likely to reflect the reality, you know, of, uh, you know, the sample is likely to reflect the reality in the population that we're sampling, um, which is, uh, which is really positive. Um, and I think actually, you know, it's good. It does allow you to compare, you know, with your neighbors, which does allow for a meaningful mm -hmm comparison although you have to be mindful of the power of the sum of the of the survey when you're getting down to individual practice level on individual questions that might not have been answered by all of the people uh completing the survey uh for example and it's a good conversation starter you know to talk to your staff um to talk to your patient participation groups um so um 
So I think it is, I think it is useful. I think it needs to be appreciated um, for what it is and within the right context, yeah. which I guess might bring us to some of the uh, limitations um, that we see in terms mm. of the, do you want to kick us off and give a few and then I'll give a few Gandhi? Yeah, so I guess limitations, um, it always annoys me that they use this concept of GP appointment. Uh, and I, I don't think it's about appointments anymore. General practice has changed. It's not about the concept of what an appointment is. It doesn't really even help define what an appointment is. It's contact. Um, mm-hmm. General practice contact is now how we should be evaluating general practice availability, access, demand, etc. It's the contact with the practice team. I think the focus on GP needs to change everything's very much around gp questions they have started to add in some additional roles that's great but actually it's still in my view it should be more about the contact not the concept of an appointment because i think for many an appointment is still a physical face-to-face interaction which actually that's not what general practice only provides anymore mm-hmm. yeah good yeah one. i yeah no, that's, that's that, that, that i agree entirely with that i think that's that's a really good insight um I would say, I mean, I think the the obvious one is I think there are, it becomes problematic comparing uh, one practice to another uh, for a few reasons. I think one is the kind of the, the statistical power when you get down to some, you know, individual mm-hmm. practice and individual questions. Um, as we said, it's a positive comparing with your neighbours, people with similar demographics. You know, I think there is some some utility there, but it's often used, particularly in these big articles, to compare practices who are existing in very different neighborhoods very different circumstances and i think it's it's really problematic to compare people from one area and and another um and actually when people have kind of analyzed this with regards to um levels of deprivation in areas i mean what you see is actually practices in deprived areas have worse results you know that yep. that that's been demonstrated statistically uh, in previous years i'd be interested to see if some of that analysis comes out again um and uh, you know, and that generally doesn't lead to a conversation about, you know, those underlying drivers, you know, mm-hmm. um, I think funding's part of that. Or I think it's just accepting that you're not necessarily expecting the same um, outcomes and the same results in different areas. And it can be so demoralizing for, um, you know, people imagine if your practice was in you know the worst 10, you know, in the area. And that may not be your may not be your fault. It may be because of the area you're working. Also, practices in difficult to doctor areas have difficulty recruiting you know yep. they have difficulty actually running the practice you know that isn't there in you know areas that are easier to recruit doctors to so i think it can be really problematic and it can be quite demoralizing so i think people need to like really be aware of that link between deprivation and challenging circumstances and poor survey results when they're looking at them yeah that's a big one gandhi um yeah, you may have more to say on that and I think what might help in terms of tackling that limitation, from my perspective, would be very much a comparison of taking the information on the GP survey um, website and, and information we collect there, cro- correlating that with the GPAD data that we have, um, and also then tackling that with the resource elements. So, you know, an evaluation of GP survey experience, product, which is the appointment data, although that still needs to be better, versus resources and funding. And actually, if you had those three comparators put against each other, I think that would be more effective in terms of an evaluation process for general practices that would help to better further that discussion about how healthcare needs to be driven. It'd be interesting to see whether ICBs are looking at that level of data and combining that, because that's, to be honest, it's not an impossible thing to do, I mm. imagine. Um, but actually, that would be far more effective at helping to understand how general practice is affecting when you compare those three different aspects of things effectively. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. I mean, they could get a lot smarter with combining these data sources with other data sources. Um, mm. You know, I don't think that's beyond um, the government or ICBs now. You know, I'd like to see um, a calculation that takes into account you know, deprivation or for that to be taken into account yeah. in terms of how we're presenting these results, for example. And I think that would make them a lot more usable. So I'd like mm-hmm. to see kind of better use of this data i think it's collected in quite a rigorous way but i'd like to see kind of just better use better presentation of the data i think that they can they can do more there um just some really obvious things is that like this is you know we look at this in july and you sometimes think what have i been doing what you know what have we you know we've tried to do things in the last you know six months to improve this you know isn't it disappointing that the data still looks like 
this is you know yeah. the data collection was in january you know and, and we're, we're looking at this in july and actually that patient might not have had a contact even in the six months before <laughs> they mm -hmm. got they got their their letter uh so there's a real it's a real lagging indicator you know i think you just need to take that into account it almost goes without saying but we do need yeah. to say that i think um yeah. on this episode. and i mentioned this at the start obviously um one of the key things that came out from the capacity improvement and acts improvement plans is the fact that actually they can't use the gp survey data because of that phasing of when they come out when they're collecting and everything else it won't capture the experience of all the changes the press being asked to make as of april this year um, to be effective for the analysis of the capacity improvement plans for next year. So actually, perhaps they're now going to have to co off and create their own version of evaluation of the experience for patients to understand that level of data for that additional resource funding that general practice is being allocated as a result of all the contractual changes that we're seeing. Mm. Which is what we're coming to next, isn't it? I think, in a sense, Andy. So, you know, how, can we um, data? <laughs> how it works and things. Yeah. So I guess, how can we use this? Um, both at practice level, you know, PCN level, whatever level you're at, really. Um, so I think the first thing to say is um, it's best used alongside other feedback mechanisms. So we've kind of talked yep. about about the limitations that you need to understand actually how the the information is produced, and you know, and and that there are limitations there. And actually, um, a lot of the data that we get ourselves from our friends and family feedback here you know, that might be more current, it might be more real time. You know, we might be able to ask specific questions that are more relevant to what we're trying to achieve or what we're trying to improve at the practice and what we're trying to measure. So, um, and actually, and there's other forms of feedback, isn't there? I think we've talked, I think there's mm -hmm. an episode we might link to about feedback, but, you know, actually complaints are important, significant events are important, you know, um, that kind of informal feedback you get from the receptionist who just has that sixth sense for, for you know, for what's happening or whether it's going to be a good or bad day or week. Um, you know, all of these things, your friends and family days, all of these things, factor in so it's only one thing that you should be looking at not the be all and end all um it tells what you do with it i mean we tend to have a meeting um every year where we look at this it often leads into a discussion as some of those other things that we look at as well um and you know, we compare ourselves to our neighbors we don't bother comparing ourselves to the leafier parts uh, of nottingham we do compare to some of the national and local um averages mm -hmm. though um and it normally leads to a you know, a fairly lively discussion. Um, I would recommend if you're having this discussion to um, what I tend to say is, you know, look, we know the data is flawed and we know that we have a difficult population, you know, and we know that it's difficult looking at this data. Let's not be too defensive about it. You know, let's just look at what the data is. And, you know, if there is a trend, let's see if we can think of positive things that we can do to improve it. You know, let's not be demoralized. Let's not dwell on the negative but he also let's be open to the fact that this is data about us and there might be some you know some real truths within it you know and some real actions that we can make so that's the sort of thing we do at practice level um how about yourself candy so I must admit, we don't tend to pay a huge focus on the gp survey uh, we have analyzed it in the past we look at it in terms of how it affects the patient care that we develop and, and obviously our access within the um, the telephone system stuff because my practice is very much telephone based in terms of its contacts we do use those particular metrics we, we don't look at all the metrics so that's the key thing oh, yeah. i think get bogged down looking at all 30 plus questions and that could be really overwhelming from a practice perspective we focus on the ones that we think matter so it's about access on the telephone we talk about trying to look at continuity we look at trust and time because we think they're more effective in terms of the experience and absolutely looking at some of the experience the patients have with our reception team as well because actually that's our front of house so we're analyzing how that works and things but i think it's important to take what are the valuable bits for your particular practice in area because we recognize that some of those are just really hard for us to tackle so obviously we have a my practice is a very high non-english speaking population so therefore it's that element of actually that those are challenges we have to look at in a different way that aren't really captured on the gp survey hmm. yeah no ab absolutely i agree um and would you do anything different at, at primary care network level you know looking at this at this stage do you think it's worth looking at primary care network uh, level could lead to some I think it is and as we move to more towards neighborhood combinations yeah for some yeah practice. no very much so yeah. I, th I think it's important to recognize it and obviously the capacity improvement plan I think is going to be the key thing that many networks are going to have to look at this data it's useful to give that derivative but actually I think networks are now going to have to look at their own potential version of this um for this financial year because that's where um the improvement plan ratings in terms of where you get that additional 30 percent um is going to come into play 
So I think you know areas are going to have to look at how they capture that information, and, and this can be a good potential guide as to what type of things to look at. You know, um, and maybe we should do an episode on, on what should your you know review you know form questionnaire yeah. your own version of this look like actually that'd be quite a useful thing to practice to to join us for a live and maybe and yeah. stuff and talk about um but i think um it's something to be aware of um and i think as a network it's probably going to be more valuable in that sense and it'd be interesting to see whether this is something that's then continued to be funded in part of the new gp contract as well yeah so so coming towards the end of the episode really we've done a lot of our summing up as we go along um yeah. Gandhi, a question I'm interested in from you, and I've got my own thought. Uh, if you could do one thing to improve the GP survey, uh, what would it be? Or your um, top thing? Get rid of the word appointment and change it with contact. Okay. That's very simple. simple. Yeah. I think I would, um, I'd, and this would take more work than that, um, I'd, I think I'd, I'd like to make it more of a rolling um, survey. Um, mm. I don't, there, there must be a reason why they have to do it all, you know, in January, but um, I'd make it rolling and something that runs throughout the year is more real time. I think that might also avoid this kind of July um, clickbait headline situation that we get into um, every year uh, as well. So that's the change that that I would make. Yeah. Any other kind of thoughts or opinions on it, Gandhi? I think it's a useful tool for practice to look at. We mentioned this already, and I would recommend that if you are a partner in a practice, if you're a practice manager, if you're a network manager, CD, have a look at this. I think it is a useful discussion point to work with. I think the other thing I would recommend people start doing, though, is recognising that this helps colour discussion. This doesn't give you the data that you may want to know about your practice population. Actually, look at how you do that individually, be more, far more effective. And absolutely feel free to look up uh, our previous episodes that where we've covered that, that will be coming up in a second, um, because I think that'll be more useful to you to understand your population level access and data and more specific around the p challenges that your patients are facing, but also your practice is facing in delivery of that healthcare as well. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think I think I've said most of given most of my feedback as we've been rolling along. So I probably mm -hmm. don't have much more to say, Gandhi. Cool. We've said it all. So I think if you do want to check out that episode we talked about with how to capture feedback and stuff, have a look right here. That's probably coming up right now. Additionally, join us next week as Andy and I are looking at some of the new information about what's coming for winter, which is probably going to colour some of the reports that you're going to see in your following year survey and stuff. That's coming up right here. That's going to be our first live episode going on a Thursday evening um, and shifting from Saturdays and stuff. So definitely jump in and join us there as we continue to tech enhance your primary care and learning. We'll catch you in the next episode.